Namaste viewers, welcome to today's live Q&A session on Hinduism. Um, in this past week, uh, we've had uh, news of uh, Queen passing away. Um, last week, uh, we... on um, Thursday evening, we believe, I believe. So the UK is in the state of mourning and uh, we, uh, we pay tribute to Queen, longest reigning uh, Queen uh, for Britain. And uh, she has served the country, her country well, and uh, we wish uh, her rest in peace for the, her spiritual journey onwards. Um, so today's uh, main topic is uh, death, period of mourning, and what uh, should we do after that? And, uh, Death rituals, and uh, we'll we'll cover the Shraddha ceremony, which is go, going on at the moment uh, in Hindu calendar as well. So we'll start with our focus topic video, and uh, then we'll start the Q and A session. So if you bear with me, I'll start the video. someone passes away what happens to the soul you know you have a 12th 13th ceremony by modern what happens to the soul in that time okay okay you see again let's let's answer this question in a kind of rational manner you see the indic tradition this is called the shrad ceremony so they say that for the next 13 days after somebody's passed away that individual has not left that locality, he's still kind of hovering around, kind of still interacting with us or looking at looking out at looking at us. But this draw not, I don't know. But they said this is the idea behind it. So they say for those days, period of mourning. According to me, this is really a period whereby the family gets its act together and kind of you know undergoes the, the bereavement process. This is the bereavement process. So here, family members come together, then go to somebody's house every day to sing devotional songs, to pacify them, to calm them, to comfort them in death. But this idea is that for a few days or say 13 days after somebody passed away, continue for two weeks to interact with that family and try and give that family support and help during the difficult, distressing time. What happens to the soul? I'll be very frank. You see, the thing is, the soul is a metaphysical phenomenon now. It's no longer physical. So whether he can interact or she, if at all the soul is able to interact according to me, it can only be through your eyes. It can see what's happening through your eyes because it is existing now in a metaphysical plane, not a physical plane. So to give any further rational reason of what is actually happening to the soul, I can't do that. Only thing I can say is this. We know that by looking at the near-death experiences that we have been recording in so many hospitals, something continues to exist even when the body dies that is a reality so there's we said that the thing that's living doesn't get snuffed out it continues to exist in some different plane so what plane it's not a physical plane we say well, how can i believe in it i say you do it every night when you go to sleep you close your eyes and you go into a different plane we call it dream world you create a world and there are monsters or nice people to chase after or whatever and you live in the dream world whole night so you create a metaphysical reality and exist in it. In the same way I'm saying when somebody passes away, they create a metaphysical world in which they exist. So if somebody says, I don't believe it, I say, do you believe in dreams? Say, of course, then it's something like that, a dreamy stage. Not a very powerful stage, not a physical stage, but a metaphysical stage. So there you go. We saw Jay by talking about uh, uh, death and period of mourning and bereavement process. And then uh, yeah, in the final stages, he was talking about uh, well, something continues to exist even after death. So the whole idea of what to do after someone passes away is the topic of uh, today's discussion. So with me is uh, Sita Ben and Vijay Bhai. Uh, welcome to the show, Sita Ben Vijay Bhai. Um, <clears throat> so the first question is, um, Sita Ben, um, what what happens at that? Do do we do what to do with the body? Uh, that that's the first question. How how should we 
you know, what to do with the body once uh, someone has died? Uh, yes, so I mean, this is the thing within uh, the, the Hindu tradition, we believe that once the person has passed away, um, the body is no longer of any relevance anymore. I mean, it's very different for different parts of the world. Um, but this is the Hindu thinking is that essentially the person has moved on, they have left the body, and it's no longer of any value or significance in the same way the Bhagavad Gita actually says, just like you change old clothes, once they get worn, you then leave those old clothes and move on to a new body um, so what Hindus believe is that it's uh, good to cremate the body um, because there's nothing left of that person in the body um, so there's a cremation which happens and usually at the time of, of mourning and grieving um, verses are read from the Bhagavad Gita which talk about the eternal nature of the soul um, so that it gives us comfort and relief that that person hasn't completely disappeared. They are still around. Um, however, they are just not in a physical body. So they are kind of metaphysical in that sense. Um, and the wonderful thing is your soul is not of this physical world. And the Bhagavad Gita actually says, you know, your soul cannot be cut or burnt or wetted or dried and nothing that applies to a physical body can apply to the soul, the individual soul. So in a way it's pure and pristine and it carries on living for eternity essentially. Um, but the body is something that is temporary because it's of the physical world and it cannot last forever. So we kind of uh, understand and respect that. That's why we cremate the body. And sometimes the ashes are then taken to some sacred water um, and uh, scattered there. Um, so that's really the essence of it. And it's a sort of gesture of saying, you know, these forces, um, you know, have brought together a physical body. All the elements have come together to make this body when that person was born. Now it's time to return those elements back to nature. So that's the whole um, significance behind sort of cremation and scattering the ashes. Uh, Vijay Bhai, any thoughts? I know, I think Sita, you've covered it pretty well. Uh, <clears throat> all I can say, as Sita mentioned, that uh, some one key point to uh, keep in mind is that as once somebody has passed away, it's important to remember the soul has left the body. I mean, there are some Hindus who believe that if unless you cremate it and do some strange ceremony, you know, like some really nasty stuff like taking the skull or whatever, then the soul, if that's not, most of the acharyas I know never accept that. So immediately, once the person has passed away, the soul has left the body. Even in some cases, you know, you may have, uh, you know, some people who are in a vegetative state and the machine is just throwing the body that also the soul is literally left because there's nothing left in the body for him to progress spiritually. So that is also basically a uh, person has left the body. So I think we have to keep in mind that unless there's the, the living forces in there, your Atman is there driving your body and using that body as a, as a tool to progress spiritually. If that body is of no value, it will leave. It'll find another new kind of body to progress spiritually. So to keep that in mind, then it's just the rituals after that to how you take care of the body, or get to the body. And that's the, the whole ritualistic. But the key thing is that the soul lives immediately after the body of, is of no use to progress spiritually. That's all I can add to that. Yeah, Wonderful. Thank you, Vijay Vaisita. And so um, continuing with, uh, if you look at the Abrahamic viewpoint, they say, you know, uh, they, they would put it in a coffin and then bury the coffin and try to preserve the body. What, what's the idea behind preserving the body? And... Is it beneficial? And if you want to preserve, then best to do mummification. What's, what's your thought on this? <laughs> well, it's an interesting, <clears throat> interesting question. It's a bit peculiar because, I mean, the uh, three Abrahamic faiths, they do believe in the idea of judgment, the day of judgment. And they also believe just like, uh, as, at least for Christianity, just as Jesus Christ was resurrected on the fourth day, that is proof that we will all, all be rejected by God at one time and then judged as and when you know, as in, as in how we are. But of course, that creates lots of different problems. But but the idea is based on the idea of resurrection. So I think there's a very strong pillar in Christianity. If that pillar is disproved, then it'll be basically Christianity uh, crumble down. That, that is such a powerful pillar, idea of resurrection. So for them, the idea is that on the day of judgment, but there's a the couple of questions not really answered. Like you bring somebody up, of what age would that person be? You know, how do you judge him? Because if he's very old, he might, his mind might not be functioning properly. You might be thinking properly, do you judge him at that age or a younger age? And quite often, I, uh, I think once, um, he calls in A-levels a lot, idea of resurrection. 
if you somebody passed away, as Sita mentioned, you become part of nature elements, and then some a tree grows there, and then say you eat the apple, Manish, right? Then which part of the element is which body? You don't even know, right? You can't judge. So there are issues and problems. But but the main issue is that somehow or the other you'll be judged for all your sin since the day you're born, and it's basically uh, you know basically left or right, heaven or hell. As Jay Bai to mention, this reward ratio is very very skewed. Is either lottery 100% or, or doom for you forever. There's no halfway. And that has actually caused a lot of problems in early Christianity. So that's the reason why the Christian church, especially the Catholic church, can be the idea of purgatory. You realize it doesn't, a lot of people find it really hard to understand. So purgatory is a place where you go and you, if you've got just a little bit seen that you've got to kind of wash over, right? Just the scale is not fully tipped, but it's a little bit tipped. You can somehow work out and then go to heaven. So there are all these different theories. But, but, but the main thing is that because God will judge them. I mean, in, in Hinduism, of course, it's we are responsible for our destiny through karma. So we don't rely on, rely on God for judgment. And that's also in Christianity, the idea of forgiveness or in Abrahamic faith is a very big thing. They all say, that, oh, I've done this crime, but God is going to forgive me. God is going to forgive me. Yeah? And that's what they you hear a lot. If you look at um, in the Abrahamic, they say it a lot. I've, I, I mean, it sounds really strange initially. But then you get used to it. Oh, I hope God forgives me. I hope God forgives me. It's not like that you are your master. You know, you decide how to improve yourself. It doesn't work. So it's, it's a lot of push on God's forgiveness. And that's a very powerful thing that they need to, to go for, you know, to have an eternity. What eternity means is that a place that is, again, very different because they believe in the idea of a place in heaven, a physical place. That's why they need the body. Yeah, we don't believe in a physical thing, right? So it's day by mention, metaphysical. So whole understanding is different. So any Asita, you can add more on that, yeah? Yeah, no, I think you covered it amazingly. And um, so there's the Abrahamic tradition, which which also likes to preserve the body. But as Manish Bai also said, it's also the Egyptian tradition as well, uh, which is such a big part of their, their culture is creating these huge pyramids um, as a way of sort of trying to, you know, resurrect and, I mean, um, to preserve um, the body. And they do all sorts of embalming and they take out bits of the inside and all sorts of things. Um, but I guess it's just, it shows the, the different ways that people like to sort of pay respect um, to those people who have passed away. And we have to respect every tradition um, for, for what they believe. But from the Indic perspective, at least, um, the, the body is no longer of any value. And it's incredible because um, a lot of uh, experiences of people who have had near-death experiences, people who are supposedly on their last legs, they are you know, at the very edge of death and they are somehow pushed back and the experiences they recount are incredible. They have this sense of feeling like they are floating above their body. They can actually see their body. They can see their relatives crying around them. They can hear the doctors and nurses talking to each other, um, all sorts of incredible things. And then they all seem to have a similar experience in that they all seem to see a tunnel of light and they are sort of pulled into this warm glowing tunnel of light and at the other end of the tunnel of light they see their relatives who have passed away um, and then sometimes because it's not their time their relatives push them back and they say go back go back it's not your time yet um, but they will say that the feeling of leaving the body is incredibly warm and freeing because you're free from so much physical pain that you may be going through um, and then when they get back in their body they're like ouch <laughs> this all hurts again um, but it's amazing how similar the experiences are of these people and you know obviously there are you know atheists and people who don't believe that anything exists beyond death and they all have different kinds of challenges for example they say oh, it's just hallucinations because of lack of oxygen to the brain. Or they say things like, um, you know, you're just imagining your relatives on the other side. But the thing is, how do you know that? Because sometimes if it's actual hallucination, you will see your living relatives if it's a hallucination, if it's like a daydream-like state. But the fact that all of these people who recount near-death experiences only ever see their dead relatives it suggests the possibility that there is some truth behind it. Um, so there's a lot to sort of think about. It's a very fascinating topic to look into, but definitely from the Hindu perspective and all Indic traditions, there is something which definitely continues to live after the body passes away. 
Wonderful. Uh, Sita, when you mentioned the body is of no value, um, and uh, nowadays, especially uh, I think in India as well, many people choose to donate their body or body organs. Um, if you choose to donate, are you doing a, a, as per Hindu rituals, or uh, you know, or should you just donate some organs and then? Uh, cremate the rest of the body. Well, what is your point of view on this, Sitarin? Yeah, that's a really interesting topic because in uh, different different religions, they all have different beliefs regarding the the body and what should be done with it. But I think it's quite sort of clean cut from the Hindu perspective that the body is no longer of any use to you. You are completely disconnected from your physical body once you pass away. So it's if it doesn't help you, why not use? those organs to help somebody and actually save the lives of other people. It's actually a wonderful gesture that you can do. So from the Hindu perspective, it's a, it's a great thing to do, to be able to use organs which are still able to function and use them to help save other people's lives. It's, it's a beautiful thing to do. Um, and, you know, we're not hard and fast about rituals either. So it doesn't detract from any kind of rituals that you want to do after, you know, or the organ donation has occurred. You can still carry out those rituals, but in the satisfaction and knowing that you're able to support somebody else who can who can live as a result of those organs. So um, organ is a, is a great thing to do. Uh, Vijay, I think so you're absolutely right. I mean, Hindus is, is fairly clear. I mean, also in the temple that I visit near near my house, the monks regularly uh, uh, raise the idea that everybody should donate all the organs and put them on register. So it's, it's a known, a known thing that it is no use to you to progress spiritually. Might be somebody else who can use an organ. So I think that's very clear in Hinduism. There are, of course, some faiths, especially in the Abrahamic faith, some not all, but some movements in the Abrahamic faith who believe that that's not right because as they, the body has some value. But I think in Hinduism or even Jainism or, or Buddhism, I think it's, it's very clear that, yeah, it's not right. Yes, uh, Vijay Bhai, um, some people um, uh, bury their dead in Hinduism as well, uh, especially I think if it's a highly spiritual person, sometimes uh, people decide to bury <laughs> rather than uh, cremate them. What's the idea behind this? Uh, it is in, in some traditions, I have seen that. I don't like the one of the, uh, you know, uh, enlightened beings that I really like a lot, Raman Maharish, he's been buried. And there's a tradition as well as the people who already are enlightened beings, uh, you don't cremate them. So they actually bury them. Uh, I don't know, the, don't know the reason behind it, but there are some, uh, some cases like that. I think one thing you have to keep in mind is that in the Advait tradition, it is believed that you can achieve uh, liberation here and now while it's alive. In the Dwight tradition in Western, I know you cannot, you only after you pass it, you can actually achieve moksha. You don't know before that, basically. You only know after you've passed away that you achieve. But in the idea of you know our tradition, that's that's the case. So in that case, it is true that uh, some of them they actually bury them. Uh, I guess in that case, the body is already it's just in that the basic body is just a hollow tool for them because they're already enlightened anyway, they don't need any more use a sense of guns, you know, intellect to really achieve. They've already done that. So in, in many ways, you can the body is just there for them to help others, teach others. There's, for them, it's no, body is no use. So whether they're alive or past, I mean, the body is really not irrelevant. It's already not relevant anyway since they're alive. I mean, if you look at the stories of, I think, Madame, uh, Ramakrishna Paraman, even when they get hurt on the body or if they feel any pain, they don't really feel it because they're not really attached to the body anyway. So in effect, I guess the body is just not cremated because... It's, it's they're already enlightened, I guess, but I don't know the true reason for that. But having said that, I mean, I know there are other examples, like in some, you know, if you look at the Tibetan tradition, or even they, they do sky burials, where there's no wood available, you know, and they just keep the body and vultures or something. I guess have a good feast or something, but in that sense, it helps another creature to live as well. So there are very different small sort of variations. But generally, I would say that it's, the cremation is the main thing to add here. Sita? Yeah, there's not much more to add, really. I think, um, I mean, probably cremation is very, probably the most hygienic way of, of dealing with a dead body. Because, to be honest, if you open up a coffin, I just, I don't even know, or no, imagine <laughs> what, what would have happened to it, to the poor body. Um, so, I mean, cremation, at least, you know, you, you just 
get rid of it in the sense that you know it's just ashes and you know you just return it back to nature and um and, and that's really all there is to it yes especially when in corona times uh, the many bodies were cremated because they did not want the corona coronavirus to spread through oh land and uh, uh, some animals eating from the land or something so at that time, the cremation was the only solution. And it's now we are back to normal. So people will go back to their normal ways. Uh, we move on from the, this uh, topic to the next one, which is uh, this period of mourning and what to do um, once uh, the body is cremated. Um, so we, we uh, Hindus have this uh, 13 days uh, of period of mourning as uh, Jay Bai mentioned. What's the idea behind this, uh, Vijay Bai? So I think that is, uh, that is the idea that, the, first of all, of course, you have to realize one thing that the loved ones are already in a state of shock at that time. And as uh, Jay Bai mentioned and Sita mentioned that God bosses from the Gita are read to give solace to people. Said, look, don't worry, he's still alive in, a, in his true form, he's better off now. His Atman has moved on to another body, much more healthier body, or maybe even achieve moksha, or whatever. But for that journey, and you want to help him on the journey and remember him. So we do all these ceremonies in the memory of to remember to kind of help them on their onward journey. But in, in more than that, I think the other good thing that I really like about the ceremony is it actually reminds us, it keeps us, it reminds us of our ancestors. I know for many, many years I did for my father, annual shroud, I used to do that. But I think only for one year you do all these ceremonies. But the idea is how do you, at the same time, have a link with your loved ones who passed away? How do you make them happy? How do you help them? You won't do something. You know, it's very difficult. You say, I wish I could have done something else. But you can't do anything. The person has passed away. The body has no value. So how do you help that person? So the idea of the 13 days is one way of giving you a solace. And look, by the way, you can help them by doing this painted down, you know, tarpan, or doing some charity work, feeding the cows, brahmin. And you actually, in a way, you feel good about it as well. Look, I've done something to depart their soul. So in many ways, it's, I think more than a person who's passed, it also helps the person who's doing the ceremony. He feels good about it. Also, he feels that he's helping the soul in his own spiritual journey. So, of course, there is, you know, different kinds of ceremony we do. I don't we do. But mainly, it was, you know, nature, ghee, water, you know, grains. All natural things are used to kind of help us do that. And of course, sometimes you make it a Brahmin to recite verses to help you in that ceremony. So the main thing is to, to somehow spread out the disconnect. Eventually, you can disconnect anyway. How do you slow that process down? And this idea of the Shrat ceremony really helps. Yeah, uh, Sita? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I think you've covered it amazingly. So I think it's it's more a matter of have, having the community there to, to support you, basically. So sometimes it's like an open house. So you just say, you know, anyone can come and visit whenever they can and give support whenever they can, basically, because it's a very sort of lonely and very difficult time when a, a close relative passes away. Um, so just having that openness that, you know, there is a community there for you um, is a great help mentally for, for many people. And um, a lot of people use this time to, to do as we do by said do some good work um, they might want to feed their relatives and they might prepare the foods that their loved one who passed away enjoyed um, as a way of sort of you know paying respect and in in memory of, of that person um, so it's a time for reflection it's a time for community and the thing is um you know we've said many times uh, a lot of hindu rituals they're not hard and fast so for you, if the grieving process, yeah, you want it to be a, a much more private affair, then there's nothing in Hinduism to stop you also doing that. Because for some people, it's too overwhelming to have loads of people visiting you and uh, asking the same questions and, and everything. It can get a bit difficult. So, you know, there's nothing in Hinduism to say you have to do it that way either. You can keep it very private as well. So the choice is yours. Wonderful. Thank you for covering that, uh, Sita Bin. Um, so next question is uh, this the 13th day ceremony. Well, what is that for, Vijay Bhai? The so, um, uh, or Teravi or the sometimes called uh, so 12th day or 13th day? I think it is believed that the first 13 days, I don't know much about it, but I mean the first 13 days, are, last 13 days basically, so that now the soul has now truly gone. You have finished all your ceremonies. And it, I think that is probably detached now, so okay, now I'm fully detached. 
I think that's the idea behind. But more than that, I'm not uh, up to that speed on that one. Yes, yeah, see that. <laughs> Uh, yes, similar. I mean, I, I don't know too much about the, that ritual aspect, but um, I just know about the whole sort of community aspect and just in memory of that person, having a period of, you know, 13 days to remember that person, really. Um, uh, my point of view in this is, uh, I, I, I agree with uh, Jaibai that uh, the, the dead ones actually are around us at that time. In a way, after 12 or 13 days, what you do saying is you do this religious ceremony to say, okay, we've, uh, you know, remember you, we remember your works and life. And uh, we are doing this ceremony to say, now you go on, onward on your own journey and uh, move on from this family to your own spiritual progress. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, that that is my take on this. And mm -hmm. Hopefully that, that, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, we take the next question is about the Srad. Uh, you know, uh, we have this Srad starting from today onwards. Uh, annually, you remember the forefathers, and then uh, I think uh, some food is uh, put out for the crows. Uh, what's the idea in that, uh, Vijay Bhai? Okay, that one I have done, so I know that one. <laughs> when my when my father passed away many many years ago, we had to every annually I would do that. Yes, I would go for quite a while. I did that. So you do a havan, a puja. I think the main thing is not to forget your ancestors and and remember what they've done for you. I think that's the main thing. Remember, I think it's more for us than them, perhaps. And I remember doing a havan, and then of course you go on the top of the house, you know, on the balcony. And then you make some millet bread or something, you do, you know, pieces. And then you call the crows and they, they take the part of the feast. I guess, I don't know, maybe pass message on or something. And I've done that a couple of, but I think it's a very good thing. I mean, that's one thing I also noticed when I was working in Japan uh, many, many years ago is that um, they actually revere the answer. They actually put them in the, you know, in the altar. You always remember that. I mean, the, the key thing you remember is this, that the reason why most of us are very successful it's because we're living on the fruits of our parents. Let's face it, really, in this day and age, at least. I mean, they had struggles. They did better than their grandparents. And now we are really living on their fruits, right? We are even better than they. We're so lucky in that sense. And I think quite often we forget that. We just see, ah, oh, you know, a burden, and parents are this. But that short thing, I think, in, in that sense, is very good. That it gives you to take some time out from your daily life, hectic life. I mean, let's face it, we're so hectic in our own life, our own egos, trying to fulfill it with your own egos every day, I want to do this, I want to do that. You actually forget that where you came from and how come, what are the seeds that made you so successful? And I think we should all keep that in mind that ultimately the, the stuff that are passed, as, as per the ability, whatever they did, he is standing on their shoulders in many ways and they're progressing further. And it's quite important we remember that. So Shraddha, I think it's in essence very good. But also not only that, you could even remember great grandparents, all the ancestors, not only your parents, but ancestors, because yeah, as far as you go down, they're the ones who set, start, start the spiritual journey, right? They're the first spiritual being, they pass spiritual message, uh, especially from, the, from mother's line, you know, mother passes spiritual message to children. So the spiritual message that we go through this day, I mean, I've, I've read my own history uh, at least for seven, eight generations, and I, I've been told, I don't know if it's true or not, that they were very, very living very primitively. It's only when they came to a, a spiritual giant or something, they started, you know, eating better food, taking showers every day or whatever, and the idea of doing proper puja, and so, so it, it kind of built into an ethos. So in many ways, all the ancestors, the ancestors of our, all our ancestors have done something or the other to bring us to this stage as we are now. So it's quite important that we respect that. So in that sense, I think, Shrad, if you read properly and you understand, then I think it's a very good thing to do. Yeah. Sita? Yeah, so I mean, it's one of those rituals that you can choose to participate in, or you can choose to not do as well. It's one of those things. Um, but it's nice to have a period every year where you reflect on on the ancestors, uh, reflect on, you know, that they're, they're your first teachers, your parents and grandparents, they're your first teachers, they're, you know, your entry into the world, you know, they're your entry into the spiritual world as well, your spiritual inheritance comes through them as well. So it's really important to make sure we pay respect to them. And I think traditionally, also, what happens during this time is that you don't 
start any new endeavours during this time because it's meant to be a time for reflection. So you're not supposed to move house or get married or anything like that in the in this period. Um, it's just meant to be dedicated to the ancestors really and remembering them every year. Because as Vijay Bhai said, life is fast and it goes by in a flash. So we need to have these days which sort of give us a time to pause and reflect on, you know, how much they have helped us. Because in a way we're sort of standing on the shoulders of giants. It's because of them that we have reached where we are now and we need to pay tribute to that. Wonderful, thank you, Sita Ben. Uh, we take a question from a viewer. Uh, question is uh, from Aristotle. Uh, the question is, He's saying, uh, do I have infinite, no, infinite number of past lives? If no, then when and how did the cycle of karma started? Yeah, okay. This is, a, this is actually a very fundamental question. It's not only a question. I mean, I'll, there are many questions like that. They all boil down to one thing. And the, what they boil down is basically, if I'm the true Atman who's already free, why am I stuck here? Every other question is secondary to that question. I mean, the thing is that the question is, why is it true divine ask which I'm already free? Why am I stuck in the material journey? It is true that a lot of Vaishnava traditions or the Dwayne traditions, they say that we have an infinite number of lives. And my mother doesn't even fail once remind me that you have done Chorya Silak Avatars, you know, and then you're still going to keep on going in struggle unless you escape. This is the last chance now. And she tells me, I can't, I can't remind me. So I think that is partly symbolic. You say that you've been stuck for altar, so many altars, please free yourself. But the main thing is this, that the question comes, why are we as divine beings deluded by this Maya and why are you stuck here? That's the actual question. So there are many, many different answers to that. Some are not as good. But I would be honest with, with the Ashtokan that ultimately none of them is satisfied fully. I mean, I know that, for example, in Ramanuja tradition, they say that Every time there's creation, all the souls, which before, before the previous creation, whatever state they were in, if they half progress, enlightened, like they're stuck in that state. When the new cycle starts from whatever states they had stored, they start again the cycle. And some achieve moksha, some don't. Some achieve moksha, but still want to come back because they won't, like the idea of praying to God again and again. It's a very famous saying in Gujarati or Hindi that Harina Jan Mage Nahi Mukti. So that you can do God's seva, right? There's some who believe that. So, but the, but the key issue is this, of course, because if you can, if you say in Christianity that look, it's a bit philosophical. If you say that God creates you, okay, yeah, fine, He creates me, He decides when to stop. But Hinduism, we're not created, right? We're not created. But I think that the, the problem is this, Manishpa, is that because you're so stuck in this existence of the world, that time means a lot to us. Time actually is something that we value, but actually it's of no value in, in many ways because you're already free. These are very glimpses on your material journey, it's like a glimpse, like a blip for the living now. And ultimately you're free and you transcend space time and position. So you're only stuck for a little while. And you just and you, it's like a glimpse and you escape immediately. The question is why are we stuck? We don't know the true answer. We do not know why we are stuck in this material journey. All we know we are stuck in this, we're trying to go back to original state, which is what is our true state is. It's like, you know, Every day I do something. If I do something, one off something, which is like a blimp, it's not, it doesn't really count, but I'm there and I come back. It's that kind of thing. So our true nature is, of course, Atman, which is already free. But the idea of how many lives there are, there is, there's a countless lives, there's no number. But the key question is, doesn't matter how many lives, it affects you, she's stuck in realm of my escape. And that's the answer, that's the main question. The question is, we do not know. All we know is that when we achieve moksha, all this it becomes irrelevant and disappears. We don't even understand it. It reminds you of the situation where, um, you know, Ramakrishna Paramas just touched his toe. He touched Rama Vivekananda with his toe. And he just went to Samadhi and when he was asked what happened, like, I don't know, everything disappeared. Like there was nothing. I was truly free, right, for that moment. And there was no space, time, nothing, causation, all disappeared. That's all, that's all he remembers and suddenly came back. So really we do not know. But all we do know is that our true state is not what we are now. Uh, Sita, anything to add? 
Yeah, I know that you covered it amazingly. So, I mean, the thing is, um, our soul was never created because if it was ever created, that means it's going to die one day because that's the nature of, of the thing. This is the nature. This is how cookie crumbles is that essentially if something is created, it has to be destroyed at some point. And our soul was never created and it will never be destroyed. So in a way, it's almost like a parallel sort of, you know, two parallel lines going on for infinity and essentially you know god is the sort of with his power is able to create these systems of you know the universe and the way it is and it's made to run for a while and then eventually it goes into chaos for it in order for a new system to come about and we have to remember that the soul is not of the physical world it's a metaphysical um you know it's it's completely does not need to follow the rules of nature as we know it it's completely eternal universal it's everything and the big question, as Vijay Bai said, which we just don't have the answer to, is why, if we are so pristine and perfect and we are the nature of the spirit, why do we get so attached to the body? And why do we think that we are the body? Because when you close your eyes and think, who am I? The first thing you think of is, I'm, I'm the body. And the Vedas teach us, actually, no, you are not the body. You are the spirit. But why do we feel so infatuated with the body is the question that actually Hindus are very blunt about. We say, you know, you can try and put clever words to it. But in fact, we don't know why this is the way this particular system has been created by this God. We don't know why. All we know is that we are essentially spiritual beings on a material journey. We've used that quote many times of Sami Vivekanan. And it's really important that at every sort of given opportunity in our daily lives, we take an opportunity to reflect, to just take some time to pause and reflect on where we are on our spiritual journey. And remember that we are not material beings, we are essentially spirit and we are perfect in every way, even though we don't feel like we are. That's wonderful to hear, Sita Bin. Uh, we take a next question from Charmaine. Uh, she's asking, uh, Hindu Academy uploaded a video to introduce spiritual quotient, quotient uh, course. This is very exciting. Uh, will it be explained today? Uh, could you please say more about this, uh, Sita Bin? Uh, yes, um, so we've been approached by um, an organization called Student Genie in India, and um, they're very sort of, uh, they, they love dad's work. They've seen a lot of his videos and all of that. And what they've said is that they've got a lot of connections to Indian schools. And the issue with Indian schools is that ironically, you're not allowed to actually formally teach religion in schools in India. So the way that we can get around that is by saying we are promoting a course not on Hinduism or religion, a course on spirituality. And um, we are actually on the journey. It's uh, you know, one of those cases where we have to knock on a lot of doors, but we've got some contacts in India who are helping us. Um, and actually we're making some progress in terms of having meetings with some schools um, in order for us to be able to teach Hinduism, but in the form of a spirituality course. So we address the same sort of you know, questions about consciousness and existence and life but we're doing it without reference to religion because that's what the Hindu education, Indian education system is like at the moment. It's ironic that we can teach Hinduism at Eton and we can't teach Hinduism in India. Um, but yes, this is the way that we are getting around it. And uh, we're very excited um, about this course because dad's passion for so long was to get you know, this idea of spirituality back to India, because we've kind of, Vivekananda has planted the seeds of spirituality in the West, you know, through America and England. And now it's really time to export it back to India where there's a need to revive this message of spirituality. So we're trying our best to carry on um, Dad's work in that way. Uh, uh, <clears throat> no, not much to add, but I, all I can say is that in India, what we have is that there are a lot of schools who are actually eager to teach about Hinduism, but the law is such that they actually cannot, which is really, really yes, a very sad situation because uh, there's something quite interesting here because, you know, I've been reading, um, I had a book by somebody called uh, Sai Deepak, who wrote a book called Bharat, uh, that is India Civilization. And some of the things are so interesting and revealing. And it's really sad that the way it's designed is that some religions have an exception. Like I think the Islamic tradition is an exception. The state will actually fund their schools and they can teach Islamic studies. Hinduism cannot be taught in schools. 
So we have this very strange situation that a lot of schools who want to teach Hinduism, uh, there are some a lot of schools where the army children go to as well, they want to teach, but they cannot teach it. So they are very, I think, positive this spiritual caution course which it has developed. So they really want to get that course in. So we have a lot of positive, I think, feedback of a lot of schools wanting to do it. But the question is, the schools, there's the schools also ask in a nice way, how do we go around this strange, bizarre uh, law? It's not even a law, it's actually in the, in the constitution of India. So the current government can't even change it. They need a majority of over two thirds, which they don't have to change that constitution. So it, it's not just a law, it's actually a more worse than that is in the constitution of India. And I don't understand that because the problem with this is that if you do not teach religion, people get misconceptions. That is just even worse. It actually it doesn't benefit any religion at all. So I know if you ask somebody in India, they have very negative idea of Christianity or Islam and vice versa. Because they pick information from the internet or some other place, which is really skewed and bad. But if you study school in a structured manner, like in the UK, then actually they get a better understanding of other religions. And it's beneficial for everybody. I mean, the key thing is you're not saying teach religion to convert people, teach religion to make people understand because India is ultimately a spiritual nation. So if you're taught in schools in a systematic manner, then actually it's beneficial for everybody. But for some reason, it's not in the constitution. But anyway, I won't go into the politics or history of it. But that's the word Sita has that of course, which goes around it. And I think it's a very good thing. So hopefully that that will kind of carry on. Yeah. That's wonderful to hear. Uh, let's hope uh, our course is a great success. We take a uh, next question from Arvind Schrodinger. Is asking why are there so many different philosophies regarding the nature of ultimate reality? Vijay, it's a good thing, uh, Arvind Schrodinger, because I tell you why. Uh, in India, the thing is one thing. One thing you will keep in mind is that if you ever look at ancient India, look at the idea of the time of the Mauryan dynasty, or even better, the Gupta dynasty, as uh, turn of the century, of turn of the uh, just after BC. India was a country of content creators, not consumers. I'll give you an example. Like, say, if you today, if you ask uh, anybody, yeah, I follow this book. I, I worship. I, I just follow the book. If you ask them, make your own thing up, they can't make it because they don't. And let's face it, but by and large, most of us are consumers of information. We watch TV. We do this. We don't create, do we? How many of us create our own music? Or how many draw their own, like Sita, draw some beautiful art? That is creating content. I think we have to go back to the Indian tradition of creating content. That's why you got thousands of scriptures, thousands of philosophies. I mean, I think Buddhism has got over 3 million kind of, you know, documents of spirituality. Because people create their own content. They think, they read, okay, what is my view on this? What is my understanding? Let me put it down. So because of that unique idea of Hinduism that we should all be contributing. And that's why in the Gita is a very famous verse saying that, uh, do what you, do you, do what you, uh, what your, your natural tendencies are. Don't do somebody else's job, even if it's perfect. Do what is your following natural instinct and tendency because you have this innate power, infinite power in you to create great things. Go for that. You may make mistakes when you're creating your infinite power to create things. You may make some mistakes, but hey, you're creating things. You're actually moving forward and using your natural talent to, to contribute to the world. So the thing is this, that uh, in India, we had, you know, Shankara says, by the before Shankara, we had this seven philosophy, you know, this, uh, these darshans we have, these great darshans, six darshans we had. And not only Astic, also Gnostic Darshan. There's some who went against the Vedas. Even they were creating their own content, like Buddhism, Jainism, Charvaks. And on one side, we had the great traditions of, you know, Sankhya Darshan, Nyaya Vaisheshi philosophy. And in Vedanta, we go seven schools, Ramanuja, Madhava. The key thing is this. It is true that quite often they conflict each other, sometimes they agree with each other. But that's the beauty of Hinduism. And we should actually value that. And I hope we don't lose that idea. And I'm hoping that Arvind Schrodinger, you'll also create some new content with your own ideas and show the world. They might, we all might learn something from it. But the key thing is this, in Hinduism, idea of giving, following through on your own part, use the material that you already have, the ancient material we have, and create something new. And that's what gives you, as Zebai says, that when you create something new, it shows you a lie. Yeah. Uh, Sita? Uh, yeah, I think you've covered it amazingly. So I think the important thing to remember is that 
uh, especially uh, from Hinduism's perspective, we are very scientific in our approach because we like to sort of look at the world and try and look at patterns in nature and try and make sense of the universe. And as sort of time progresses, um, our human thinking continues to evolve and we get a clearer and clearer vision of the nature of reality. And that's exactly what science does. We had, you know, ancient theories which have been disproved and we find a new one and a new one and a new one. Uh, so every theory that we have is always a so far so good theory. And that's why we've got so many different theories out there is because through the process of human evolution in thinking and trying to understand the universe, we keep kind of updating our, our understanding of reality. And we're very scientific in that way. We don't get stuck in a rut in Hinduism. We don't say, this is because, you know, this was said a thousand years ago, we can't question it or we can't think about it for ourselves. Um, but actually we're finding that we're finding so many similarities between what ancient Hindu philosophy has talked about in terms of cosmology and the nature of the universe. And amazingly, a lot of it does sort of ring true with modern science. For example, the thinking that you know, the universe has got the sum total of cosmic energy always remains the same. It's something that modern cosmology has proved, but it's also something that ancient Hindu philosophy has talked about as well, because, you know, we have the big bang and we have the big crunch, but then a whole new system will come up after that. So it's, it's very, very, there's a lot of similarities um, between ancient Hindu philosophy, which was gained through introspection and sort of modern science which has all these amazing gadgets and gizmos and has come up with very similar conclusions um, but that's the, basically the point is that you get so many different versions of you know theories which continue to be updated and improved and we have new methodology and new words to help express it better. That's wonderful to hear Sita Ben. We take a next question uh, from um, Cyber Kant. He's saying in uh, Christian traditions, people often read uh, 23 Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd at the funeral and for comfort. Are there popular texts that are read at Hindu funerals for giving comfort? Vijay Bhai? Yeah, so uh, yes, I've heard that very famous Psalm as well. But I think the main thing is in Hinduism, yes, we have the Gita. The Gita is actually used a lot, but in a different context in the sense that Rather than saying, Lord is shepherd, it just reminds you of your true nature. That's the aim of the Gita, is that you are not the body. You are something far, far more powerful, far, far greater. Something very amazing, something great and divine, who is timeless, you know, formless, eternal. And that is what the Gita does remind you. So that is what is read to give strength to, you know, the loved ones, I mean, the person who is just, to help the soul continue the journey forward. So the message is slightly different in the not in the sense that Lord is a shepherd, but that you are something more than the body and you you still have to live and thrive outside the body. That's the key message, Asita. Oh uh, yeah, I think you've covered it amazingly. So I mean, as as Vijay Bhai said, it's all about reminding ourselves that you know, once the physical body passes on, it doesn't mean that that person has also disappeared. That person is still there, their soul still continues to exist, and it will continue to exist for eternity. And it's a great comfort to know that that person is still, you know, there. Um, and in a way, they're sort of you know freed from all the sort of limitations of a physical body all the pain and suffering they're free from all of that so they're now metaphysical beings rather than physical beings that's wonderful to hear so in the funerals i've been uh, I've, I've heard some verses from chapter two especially which is about nature of atman and you know they will say even if the body is uh, uh, dies, uh, the soul, uh, the Atman or the soul continues to live and will be reborn again and again until the uh, moksha is achieved. Uh, and uh, one other uh, quote that I have heard uh, many times, I think it's from chapter two as well, which is Jatasya uh, uh, Mutyu. You know, death is fixed for uh, the, all the living beings. So that is the reality. And that, that's quite popular, I've heard at funerals as well. So if you look at the chapter two, that is, uh, it's quite comforting that to know that uh, uh, Atman is eternal and ever present and is not uh, slayed by, slain by anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think some of those verses are quite wonderful to read at uh, funeral. Uh, we take a next question. 
Uh, give me a second. Uh, Magpie uh, Moon saying, I went to temple and I felt lost. I would love to spend time talking with the priest. Is this common practice or how do I learn more? Yeah, I think if you go to a temple, usually the priests are busy doing things here and there. It's good to try and book some time because there's no, there's no kind of, if you know, if you go to a Christian church, you go to a confession or something like that. Usually it's a bit more, it's not that, that's not organized because it's very free in the way when you go worship, how you worship. There are no that many rigid rules in a temple, except of course, basically like, you know, taking your shoes off. You can go pray how you want, you know, and just, so there's no rules. So in a way, it can be tricky sometimes to find the right person. So you'll have to research and find out first who can help you. Is it some sort of person in the temple or somebody's more learned or get some time from the priest? If you ask someone to arrange the time, then I think it's best, best, that's the best to do it. As there'll be no fixed time to get solo somebody in that sense. I mean, I, I've struggled as well sometimes. So I have, to, I have to tell somebody, okay, I'll come and so and so they then you can discuss something. But that's, that's because temples are very free in how they do things. It's, it's difficult sometimes to get something in a rigid, organized manner. Uh, so I can add to that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that's the thing. So, um, you know, you have to, I guess, make an appointment like, like you do with meeting uh, most people. But I think the important thing to also remember is that, you know, the, the priests in the temple, they, you know, you can go to them for guidance and support. But Hinduism is so incredibly vast. You don't need to just rely on the temple priest. There are so many, you know, amazing enlightened individuals whose teachings you can also turn to for guidance. So it's important to also remember that you can you can turn to them as well. That's wonderful to hear. Uh, we take a next question uh, from Soham. He's saying if someone commits suicide, do they become ghost? And what happens in that state? How is the life of ghosts? Can they hurt us and can we contact them? <clears throat> Many questions roll into one. Sita. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I mean, um, we do believe that something does continue to exist after the person has died and possibly, you know, somebody who has committed suicide in, in this kind of way has sort of gone through a lot of mental trauma and a lot of difficulties and they may feel a bit, 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 a bit lost really. Um, but I mean, from I have very limited knowledge or experience in terms of ghosts and all of that. I mean, I, I know when I sometimes ask my dad about it, he says, just don't even think about it. Don't think about ghosts, because sometimes it can pull your mental energy down to think about ghosts and things like that. You've got the whole sort of living kingdom to interact with. Why do you want to interact with somebody who's not, not physically around anymore? Um, but I think the thing with, with, with uh, spirits and ghosts and things like that is that it's probably best to sort of keep a distance from them, um, you know, keep, pay your respects, keep your distance and just wish them well on their onward journey and hope that they find their way. Um, but I guess you could do prayers for lost souls, I guess, um, to help them on their spiritual journey. But I know my dad's <laughs> advice was stay away from thinking about, about ghosts and trying to make contact with ghosts because in a way, it's a bit of a morbid way of looking at the world, uh, focus on the living world rather than the world that has gone and passed away. Uh, you very true, Sita. I think, well, I, I'll tell you my experience. I've actually been to a very famous temple in India. It's, it's called a, a Sarangpur Temple, where it's a Hanuman Temple. And I have seen these priests trying to remove ghosts from a lot of people. I think they actually schizophrenic. They don't, they don't really have ghosts. But, but the thing is, if you commit suicide, what happens is that you are still there's some, so much sorrow in you and then you still don't want to get away from the sorrow and you're finding it difficult to move on. And that's why some scriptures or some people say that they're stuck as ghosts moving around because they still cannot get over the sorrow from what they've faced. So they can't think of moving forward. And the idea is that by doing prayers or doing what other activities help them to forget that sorrow and to move forward. So the, the key thing is how to make sure it doesn't still get attached to the, you know, uh, to this world and still move on. And that's what I've seen in some, and it's very strange and very scary when I'm in this temple and, and you see people speaking in, uh, somebody speaking a different tone, changing their character and speaking in a strange voice. And then the priest, then I ask the, the priest and he goes, actually somebody's entering the body. He doesn't want to leave because he has an unfulfilled wish. So quite often, maybe that's the reason, but as I would say that there's tremendous suffering in our, as well as, our world as it is, Please focus on lifting others who are still struggling in this world rather than trying to waste your time, you know, focusing on this boss. All you can do is pray for them to go on and move on the journey. 
So as Jai Bai said, focus on the living God, which is in front of you, which needs your help. Very interesting answer to a very interesting question there. Uh, we take a next question from uh, Seeker. This will be the last question uh, for this session. He's asking, can you please give me scientific explanation of Panch Mahabhutas? Do they have any physical meaning or are they just symbolic? Panch Mahabhutas, are they earth, sky, ether, air, and water? Vijay Bhai? Yes, so Panch Mahabhuta are basically part of Prakriti. The idea is that as they come together, we, you know, we form this body and we use that to progress spiritually. That's the main. So what's the question, Manish? But I didn't get the full question. What is the scientific reasoning behind it? Are they physical or? Well, all, all I can say that this, no some of scientific reason, because as I say, we don't distinguish between the two, science and spiritual and Hinduism. But if you look at Sankhya Darshan, the idea of the five elements, they actually come together and create this universe. And we use those to infuse the spirit in it, which is our, us, right? Through spirit, and we use the spirit to help us again free from it. Uh, that's all I can add to that, <laughs> Sita. Anything more on uh, that? Yeah, I mean, not much more to add. I mean, I guess because all places, all traditions around the world are trying to make sense of the world and what's going on in the world. And the way that we've done it is, you know, in ancient times was trying to find categories of things like earth and fire and air and water, because when we categorize it, we're better able to make sense of it and understand it. So in a way, it's quite a scientific um, approach to just kind of put things in boxes so that our heads can get around it. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's one of those things that, you know, we, we respect and we recognize that spirit is inhabited in, in all of these elements in earth and fire and water. Um, and the whole of, you know, our journey um, is to try and understand the world and what's going on in it and notice all these patterns and things. And this is the pattern that we found in ancient times, these five elements. And uh, we, we pay respect to it. For example, in the Arati ceremony, sometimes you light uh, five lamps to represent the five elements as you pay respect to the idea of God. So we're paying, giving thanks and giving respect to the natural world, I guess. That's wonderful to hear. Uh, we take one more question since we have a couple of minutes left. The question is, um, should non-Hindus be allowed to use uh, Sanskrit names and in their businesses and uh, Sanskrit uh, symbolism? Are they allowed uh, or should we, do Hindus have uh, monopoly over this? Uh, see that uh, no, not at all. I mean, Hinduism is a religion where we don't hold copyrights over anything. So if you want to use the Om sign or whatever, um, please use it. But the, there's a big caveat to this as well, is it just needs to be respectful because sometimes you find, you know, sometimes images and uh, symbols are used in not the right sort of context. For example, I remember many years ago, they were producing, there was a company that was producing toilet seats with images of gods and goddesses on it. And of course, that's very disrespectful. So as long as it's done in a respectful and meaningful way, we have absolutely no issue with it. Um, I, I guess another example of it being misused is the, the Nazis uh, misusing the swastika. Of course, <laughs> Hindus would not be very happy about that. So um, it needs to be done in the right, respectful way, in a way that understands the significance and meaning behind it. Uh, Vijay Pai? Uh, I think so you pretty much covered it. Yeah. I, I know in ancient days there was an issue that there was some Brahmic, Brahmanical families would actually uh, preserve the mantras only for themselves. If somebody else said that it would be like sacrilege. But I believe in this modern world. So yeah, please use any some symbols. If they inspire you and make you positive or helps you in some way in a positive manner, then I don't see I mean Hinduism is Sanatan Dharma, Sanatan Dharma is universal. So yeah, free to use it as you want. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you everyone for your questions and joining us uh, today. Uh, it's been good to have you today. Uh, we share a quote by Swami Vivekananda, which is uh, I believe is relevant for today's topic. Um, so the quote goes, uh, Swami Vivekananda says this, may I be born again and again and suffer thousands of misery, miseries so that I may worship the only God that exists, the only God I believe in, the sum total of souls and above all my God, the wicked, my God, the miserable, 
my God, the poor of all races, of all species, is a special object of my worship. So we're bringing reincarnation into the topic of uh, uh, that and, uh, uh, you know, uh, what happens after that and uh, uh, rituals after that. So this, uh, with this, we conclude today's session. Thank you for joining and hope you have a wonderful week and hope to see you again next week. Thank you, everyone.